A Satire Against Reason and Mankind by John Wilmot Hello and welcome to the discourse. John Wilmot was a courtier of King Charles II during the Restoration period. He was a witty entertainer and learned poet who charmed the monarch. It was the period when the whole of England was reacting against Puritan austerity and spiritualism. John Wilmot emerged on the lines of cavalier poets, supporting the monarch and satirizing the clergy. He indulged himself in excesses, being a womanizer, alcoholic, and addicted to immoral behavior. He became famous as a rake and died at the young age of 33. He was a well-learned poet who wrote some good works. His contemporary poet Andrew Marvel described him as the best English satirist. In 1674, he wrote a poem titled A Satire Against Reason and Mankind, which became his most popular and successful work. In this poem, he offers support for his rakish behavior while satirizing the logical lifestyle in particular and the whole of mankind in general. He expresses himself as a natural being, an animal dependent on his instincts, and suggests that the five senses a human possesses are superior to the sixth sense that man devises as reason or logic. While trying to satirize reason, the poet uses his own reasoning and suggests that his reason is natural and thus is better than the false reason humans devise to declare what is good or bad. Wilmot says that ability to use reason or logic makes men compare themselves to God. Thus, relying upon logic is actually blasphemous. He also stresses that as mankind gives up their natural instincts in favor of reason, they become baser and tend to exploit each other for no understandable reason. When animals prey on each other, it is justifiable because it is out of necessity for food. But there is no way to vindicate man for attacking one another. A satire against reason and mankind is not a monologue as Wilmot introduces an adversary to the poet who is clergyman and like an Anglican Christian of that period believes that moral certainty could be reached with the aid of reason. It is a lengthy poem with 20, 225 lines arranged in stanzas of varying lengths. The general format is rhyming couplets while the lines depart from rhyming couplets at some points. The poem strongly appears to support the idea of hopes and Montaigne and other materialistic and libertine philosophers like Lucretius and Epicurus. Summary of a satire against reason and mankind. The poem begins as, Were I, who to my cost already am, one of those strange prodigious creatures, man, a spirit free to choose for my own cheer, what sort of flesh and blood I please to wear? I would be a dog, a monkey, or a bear, or anything but that vain animal who is so proud of being rational. This sets the poet's position who believes that animals live a superior life to humans and suggests that mankind is the worst, and the reason for this is the too much pride in humans for being rational. Man believes that his rational faculty is superior to the natural instincts that he can understand through his five senses and depends on his power of logic to guide his actions. He ignores light of nature, sense behind, and instead pathless and dangerous wandering ways takes. He stumbles upon one thought to next and finally falls into doubt's boundless sea we are like to drown. Books bear up him up a while, keeping a man afloat through bladders of philosophy. However, the poet claims that actions based on instincts are swifter and better while when man indulges himself in reasoning, he loses precious time as he is mortal. The poet says that man tries to evade the fact that he has to die and uses reason as a tool against his mortal being, in hopes still to overtake the escaping light. However, death is inevitable and it occurs more grotesquely than old days and experience hand in hand lead him to death, make him to understand after a search so painful and so long that all his life he has been in the wrong. In the third stanza, the poet chides himself too. John Wilmot was a wit, a jester and a public performer. He says that as the ability to reason filled man with pride, it drew him in as cheats their bubble sketch, which makes him curious to find knowledge and that wisdom ruins his happiness. His ability to think makes him witty and that ensues a frivolous 
pretense of pleasing others at his own expense. As wits are like whores, being a wit himself, the poet expected a similar fate as a whore. The crowd enjoys a wit's performance and claps for him, but that isn't the affection for the wit. It's like men enjoys whores in bed, but won't commit to them. While a wit provides momentary pleasure, once that pleasure has subsided, what remains is hatred. Thus, the poet criticizes reason as a false sense created to overrule the less delicate five senses. It is a sense created out of and to serve pride. He compares a wise man and, as a, and a wit as examples of futility and wasted life. He explains that a wit or a performer is clapped by crowd. Tis not they are beloved, but fortunate, and therefore what they fear at heart, they hate. He emphasizes fear at many other points in the poem and makes a point that while it is believed that reason can make you free of fear, the reality is just different. Your ability to reason promotes fear. In the fifth stanza, the poet introduces his adversary, a clergyman who opposes his idea and tries to defend reason, making it a debate. What rage torments in your degenerated mind to make you rail at reason and mankind? The clergyman claims that reason dignifies man and makes him better than beasts. He asks the poet to remember that man was made in God's image, was given an eternal soul and this fair frame in shining reason dressed to dignify his nature above beasts. He says that God gifted man with rational faculty to take a flight beyond material sense and divine into mysteries than soaring peers the flaming limits of the universe. The poet then argues that he is willing to relent if his adversary can name a single person worthy of being called reasonable. He then offers many examples of such people who according to the poet represents false reason and says this supernatural gift that makes a might think he is an image of the infinite. The poet then claims that such a belief that reason is the supreme gift is an artificial argument to substantiate a man's pride that tempts him to feel like God. A whimsical philosopher before the spacious word his tub prefer. The poet attacks the popular idea of Diogenes that one practices virtue by resisting all pleasure. The poet says that for this false notion many retire from life simply to think but that thought should be given for actions government and to seize action results in impertinence. Thus our sphere of action is life's happiness and he that thinks beyond things like an ass. In the next stanza, the poet suggests that his own reason for considering his natural five senses superior to reason is right and woes to obey it, as it is distinguished from false reasoning by sense, giving us rules of God and ill, and boundaries for desires with a reforming will, to keep them more in vigor, not to kill. In the next stanza, the speaker again attacks those who consider themselves reasonable and wise. He says that wise men attain reason by surest means. Here the poet attacks a contemporary adversary politician Sir Thomas Mears who was a prominent Whig party member. The poet compares him to a dog and suggests that a hound may be more reasonable than him who considers himself wise. The poet again describes the superiority of beasts over mankind and says that a beast kills only for practical reasons while a man lacks any reason for the various atrocities he commits. Man betrays his fellow man through fear, not through necessity but wantonness, for hunger or for love they bite or tear, while wretched man is still in arms of our fear. For fear he arms and is for of arms afraid. From fear to fear, successively betrayed. Pays fear the source whence his best passions came, his boasted honor and his dear bought fame. At the end of the poem, the poet offers a chance for himself to be proven wrong, but only if a just man can be found. This idea of a just man doesn't suggest that the poet believes that mankind can improve, but rather it is him supporting his own argument because he knows that this man does not exist, nor can ever exist. The ending lines are, if such there are, yet grant me this at least, man differs more from man than man from beast. 
The poet suggests that a just man cannot exist, and if it ever appears, then it will be observed that he, the just man, differs from the current mankind more than he differs from the beast. Again, the poet claims that a just man will be more like an animal rather than mankind, having pride in their reason. So this is it for today. We will continue to discuss the history of English literature. Please stay connected with the discourse. Thanks and regards.